Delta Company presents Diet Challenge is a one-of-a-kind project, the nine participants of which were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I think I became more open and organized. I keep the pause before food, after an insulin injection. I am practically hypoglycemia-free. It's a six-month transformation process. The first three months are under the supervision of an endocrinologist, a psychologist and a trainer. The cockroach has four legs. Managing diabetes is a skill. It's a complicated skill. Second stage, three months of independent work without the experts. My glasses fogged up. Real stories. Real success. The ice has broken, gentlemen of the jury. Real victories. A reality project about the lives of people with diabetes. Diet challenge. When a person wants something really bad, they can achieve anything. We challenged ourselves, have you? Today is the sixth weekly group meeting at the cottage. The participants of the diet challenge prepared some questions which they think will be important to discuss. The interaction with the experts will be held in the format of a round table. Dear experts and the participants of the diet challenge, we begin our round table meeting, and the first question will be from Nyura. Please go ahead. Nyura Sharikova was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of four in 1989. Only a handful of doctors even knew about this disease. For the longest time, they could not understand why I lost so much weight. I literally dried up. We came to a doctor and he said that she lost weight and is thirsty due to either having diabetes or hemoptosis. We did a blood test, I didn't even know what diabetes was. It felt like our whole life began to crumble. When I was in the hospital, there was a mother with her baby, a two or a three-year-old. I saw her heart breaking when she looked at her daughter giving her injections for the first time. Then she taught the baby how to do this. For most parents, a chronic disease diagnosis is the loss of the future that the parents had envisioned for their children. Diabetes usually puts an end to those hopes, because many aspects of life change and many parents have a hard time dealing with this condition. When we were diagnosed, I cried for two years. I cried every time I heard the word diabetes. I cried because I didn't know what kind of future awaits us. I read in a book that your child has 21 years to live after they have been diagnosed with diabetes. Having already gone a very long way, I always say I should not have cried these two years and instead should have spent the time with my child. Nyura is 33 now. Field of activity, public relations. Communicating with people and text work is like breathing for her. One of the New Year's gifts to my relatives and friends was a small writing collection of mine. I called it Home Memories. It's basically stories and memories from my life, about my brothers and my parents. It's about my family. Her own Daya blog. Traveling, camping, scrapbooking. It's too bad that there are not 27 hours in a day. If there were 30, it would be even better. That's a dream. There's just no time for anything. This is Sirioja, my beloved Sirioja. He fully supports me in everything. He also made me make the video for Diet Challenge to participate in the project. Nyura's first reaction? It is sad to miss the summer. She had to choose between a camping vacation and daily work to improve herself. Nyura chose the latter. Now I am here every Sunday. I'm all dressed up instead of camping with backpacks. 
I don't know everything. One of the reasons for coming on the project was to learn. Because when I was diagnosed with diabetes, we didn't have a doctor and my parents had to figure everything out on their own. Together with her parents, Nura learned to calculate the amount of bread units in products. She also used the trial and error method to choose insulin doses and to find out her blood glucose level. When I was a child and we didn't have glucometers, but doctors already knew of hypoglycemia, my parents tested me the following way. They would take my hand and hold it. My body would shiver and so would my hands. My parents knew I was having hypoglycemia and something had to be done. It's hard to mistake a hypo for anything else. You can feel it. However, people with great diabetes experience lose sensitivity to it. If we're talking about hyperglycemia, when our sugars are high, it's possible not to feel it. I have polyneuropathy. I have zero sensitivity to sugar, so I trust my glucometer 100%. I can have a reading of 2 or 20 and I will unfortunately feel the same. It doesn't matter. I've had polyneuropathy the last 5-6 years. Ever since then, I have total control. Thank goodness we live in a time when you have everything you need to control your diet. Diabetes. We used to have a lot less opportunity to compensate the disease. Now there are many more opportunities every day. The insolence that we had before and the insolence now are so different. There are none of these syringes that had to be boiled in water. I have a question about hypoglycemia. What should be the hypo treatment process? And what to do if you overate? While treating a hypo? Yes. Thanks for the question. If it's not a situation in which you can't even open your mouth, the standard hypo treatment procedure is to drink about 200 milliliters of juice, which is about two bread units, and that's the exact amount needed for hypo treatment. It is also possible to do with white sugar, though I'm not a big fan of it. I would dissolve the sugar in something. Many use honey for hypo treatment. I don't advise doing that if possible unless you have nothing else. Overall, juice is the most optimal choice. I heard of a rule called the rule of 15s. If your sugar drops below 3.9, you have to take 15 grams of any fast digesting carbs. Then 15 minutes later, check your blood sugar and if it's still below 3.9, repeat the steps until it goes up. That's a step-by-step -step scheme, a good addition. You said 200 milliliters of juice is two bread units. One BU raises your sugar by 5 millimoles per liter, therefore two bread units will be 10 more. That's not true, not by 5. It won't do less than 4. In that case, it depends on your weight. On average, one bread unit does not raise it by 1 or 2 millimole. It raises it up by 2 for me. On average, it raises by 2. It's about 0.5 for me. <laughs> For some, one BU raises it to five. Therefore, two BU could be too much. Okay, here's what the doctor should say. Target for glycemic control. This may completely vary for everyone, including the hypo treatment process. When the choice is juice or a chocolate bar, you should not be treating with a chocolate bar, because chocolate is full of fats and will make the process of hypotreatment longer. Okay, so let's say you overate. What do you do? An injection right away or what? Again, I do not speak for everyone when I give an answer here. It is very different for everyone. Some may have hypos several times a day and constantly eat to treat hypos. We have some people like that here on the project. It's best to talk about individual tactics. The best tactic to avoid hypos and overeat. Eating. The first thing we must do while compensating diabetes is not to lower blood sugar, but to avoid hypos, which happen due to a wrong choice of therapy. It's very hard at night, your hands are shaking, you're not even counting anything. You just realize you're sitting on the floor with all sorts of wrappers around you and you think, Jesus, I ate way over 15 grams. 
You just ate? Oh god, it's not helping. It's only been two minutes and you're already panicking. The tremor continues, but these 15 minutes are crucial. You have to endure it. I began to do many new things. For example, after my before meal injection, I keep a pause. Most importantly, I don't know how the young people who were just diagnosed with diabetes do it. But the older generation has many stereotypes that they swear by and can't get over. My stereotype was the time of my basal insulin injection. I have a set time for my long-acting injection. And that is that. I never even thought that I could change that set time. Hello? Yes, hello, Anna. Have a seat. As soon as I entered her office, Anastasia told me to change the time of the long-acting injection. The whole picture is different and so are the sugars. The project is breaking stereotypes. My dinosaur stereotypes that I can't get rid of. Let's take a look at the specific situation. The sugar is at 11.8, you take two units to lower it, with only 15 minutes gone by. Of course, it has not dropped yet, so you understand. The downtrend is there, but the sugar did not drop. You start eating again. Let's take a look at what you had. That's at 10 p.m. What did you have? What's written down here? An orange. You had an orange. What is an orange? Fructose. Fructose. You chose a bigger dose than needed. And to be honest, I don't get why you would do that for. If you are certain that the given amount of insulin will lower your sugars, why do you do more of it? You chose a bigger dose because of your insulin pen. It gives you no choice. So eat, but think about what you're eating. Do you know what this could have led to? She's open. She's open to learning. She understood some things and certain concepts in the process of living with diabetes. Unfortunately, it's not enough for her disease compensation. We move on to Vasily with a question from Dina. Please. Diabetic emotional burnout. How can you tell if it's starting? I'll explain. When you've lived with diabetes for a long time and you've been compensating, there comes a moment when you just get sick of it all. How can you tell that you're at that stage? How can you overcome it? At the core of the emotional burnout lies the exhaustion of the central nervous system. This fatigue is due to large amounts of stress, and nootropics could be the answer here. These are the irreplaceable amino acids, B-group vitamins and magnesium, a pharma support of sorts. Of course, this is only after a doctor's consultation. What is the root of the psycho-emotional exhaustion? It always arises because of over-emotional response. It's no use expecting the cause of the over-emotional response to be eliminated on its own. Therefore, the development of psycho-emotional regulation skills is a strategic goal. Symptomatic therapy, along with nootropics, may be necessary. Here's a combination of two things. Psycho-emotional regulation skills that you develop with the help of a specialist and nootropic support. Thank you. This question is going to Alexei. Dmitry, go ahead, please. Alexei, please tell us, what effect do insulin injections have on muscle growth? How the insulin affects muscles? Yes. Muscle growth or fat burning? Yes. Okay, look, insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's a hormone of peptide nature and is responsible for transporting nutrients to the muscle or fat cells. Therefore, knowing these factors, you can adjust your appearance. 
There are certain schemes that are quite dangerous, when people try to gain muscle mass, even people without diabetes. People without diabetes also inject insulin. Yes, they inject insulin before a workout and then eat different amino acids throughout the workout. Or they just eat carbs to fill up their muscles with glycogen. Since we know that during a workout we're actively using up a lot of glycogen, they eat carbs and with the help of insulin improve their glycogen muscle compensation. Therefore, the muscle does not get tired and it has more nutrients for growth. There's another side. Insulin is an antagonist of the growth hormone, which is responsible for, well, partly responsible for fat burning. And so, if we have insulin in the background during training, the fat burning process will not stop, because either way, if there's a calorie deficiency, fat burning will continue, but this process may slow down. This is why it is important to catch those peaks. The training should not occur during an insulin peak. Does decompensation somehow affect the speed of getting yourself into shape? That is, suppose if a person with good compensation and a person with bad compensation do the same thing and do it correctly, will there be a difference in their progress? Yes. Um, in detail, please? A person with good compensation will always progress faster. Again, a person with bad compensation will also have progress. He will have progress, but it will be slightly complicated by various complications, like let's say diabetic problems that happen because of high sugar levels. Also low sugars if we're talking about weight loss. Sugars drop during training, so we eat sugar. We eat sugar and fat burning happens due to firstly the exhaustion of glycogen in the muscles, after which the body switches to its second energy source, the fats. While the first source of energy is in our body, the body will never begin to burn fat. Therefore, we seem to be burning our glycogen with intense strength training, and we eat up sugar. So we replenish the stored glycogen and give the body no chance to use the fat energy. Therefore, if a person has bad compensation, the progress will be a bit slower. The rope exercise. You have seen it, yeah? Shake it like this. It will probably be difficult for the girls. Take one rope with one hand. During the last month and a half, every participant showed improvements, some more than others. Three, two, one, begin! Veronika has said that she hates working out. Initially, she had three workouts a week. Afterwards, Veronika came up to me and told me that that was not enough and she would like to do more. Everybody is trying to complete the assignments. It's clear that some have a harder time than others. I can't! One, two! You can pull a plow with Nyura. I mean, Nyura is very, very good at handling big loads. Her body is very strong. This is the merit of my parents. They always took care of me. They would take me on vacation every year to see the ocean and to a special sanatorium for kids with diabetes. Nyura went camping on par with adults from a young age. The parents decided the child with diabetes needed constant movement and fresh air. I had a little backpack with a potty, a spoon and potatoes. We went winter camping. I was two at the time. Ever since then, I've been going to the country with tents. Of course, there are difficulties when it comes to diabetes. It's not always possible to correctly count the bread units. You can't guess every time. Many people with diabetes, including me before the project, often wing counting the number of bread units and carbs. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. I brought a scale with me on my last trip to weigh every piece of meat that I ate and wrote it all down. Nyura talks about life with diabetes in her blog. She's not ashamed of her mistakes. On the contrary, talks about them openly to warn others. I am writing about good, cheap places to eat in Vietnam and at the same time talk about how I can't count bread units here. Because to be honest, I forgot to bring my scale. If I brought my scale, I could at least weigh some of the sweet stuff that I ate, like fruit for example. The image of an avid traveler led to Nura's bombardment with questions. 
How do you handle long flights? Where do you store your insulin in hot climates? How does airport security react to a suitcase full of dia supplies? How do you go through customs with all your equipment? Pump, syringes, is a very popular question. But I have never had any problems. I was always saved by the code phrase, I'm diabetic. All the custom officers know about diabetes. Whenever I leave for a trip, I always take extra insulin, test strips, my glucometer, a second glucometer in case the other one breaks. I take batteries. It's best to put it in your hand luggage. Don't put it with the rest of your luggage, because it might get lost, stolen or sent with a different flight. Another thing that I always take with me is a silicone bracelet that says I have type 1 diabetes. God forbid something happens, people should be able to see it. The next participant, Lena, will ask Anastasia a question, please. Anastasia, my question is on daily calorie deficit. What effect does it have? Can it cause weight loss to slow down? Thanks for the question. You think that I will give you a specific number of calories and that you'll be set with that amount for a very long time. This is why all of your actions are aimed at satisfying your need today for these calories that we selected, and to choose the right insulin doses accordingly, and so on and so on. I assure you, this won't last long. They will always change, because the activity coefficients with which we got acquainted will continue to change throughout your life. For example, we counted the calories. A person needs 1500 a day, yeah? However, he cannot eat that amount. What consequences can there be? With that, the weight will not decrease. But it's a deficit, and a big one. It won't? No, of course not. The body will still ask for everything. The body is like a bear in a cave, as I always say and compare. The body will store all of it. What if a person gets full after 1200? They need more. You have to make yourself eat very, very slowly. Sometimes, on the contrary, I'll give less than usual. I tell them, okay, you can't do it, don't eat then, we'll just give you less. And then later, slowly, spoon by spoon, you know? It's especially difficult with women that are over 40, when all of them want to look good for their testosterone-fueled lean abs husbands. Alexei still got time until 40. They come to me with a calorie count of 700. Really, 700, 750, 800. This is what they come in with. They don't get why they're not losing weight. They go to the gym, she runs around the yard with her husband, but the weight goes nowhere. Can I also add something? Yes. Why does it sometimes feel like you're not hungry? When we're stuck in such a calorie range for a long time, our metabolism slows down. And this will simply not allow eating. How can it let you want to eat if you will want to eat but will not eat? The metabolism will spin out. You'll lose weight, but won't give any food. The body will simply die. It protects itself in this way, by slowing down your metabolism. And you'll never want to eat, unless you begin to eat. To give the body the norm that it needs. To gain, yes? It's not only to gain, it's to reduce body mass. First and foremost, to reduce. The volumes for gaining are completely different. For gaining, by and large, we almost certainly run into protein cocktails and such. Because it's impossible to eat that amount. Simply impossible. And it's a fine line with weight loss. If anybody has any other questions, if you're not trying to lose weight, uh, what are the dangers of a thousand calorie diet? Where did this 1200 come from? Now, I'll say it again, if you're not in the process of losing weight, you're happy with everything, you just don't want to or can't consume the 1200. It all depends on how active one is, meaning if you just sit on your bum and do nothing, then 1000 to 1200 is the minimum for women. 1000 or 1200? I was taught at the well-known institute and it was always 1200. Is 1200 considered law? We look at the basal metabolic rate, women of average height and weight with an activity coefficient of zero. That is how metabolism works. A woman on average needs 1200 calories and men above 1500. That's the basal metabolic rate. Thanks, Anastasia.
The next expert that will be answering a question will be Vasily. The question comes from the youngest Diet Challenge participant, Anastasia. Please. Vasily, my question is this. How does diabetes affect the psyche and what consequences may it lead to? There are people for whom illness, including diabetes and others, is a sort of a challenge, and they organize their lives in accordance with overcoming this challenge. There are people that see their condition as a curse. Respectively, this curse gets a hold of their lives, producing appropriate fruit. It is clear that the unstoppable and uncontrollable condition leads to organic lesions, because an excess of glucose has its effect on the vascular system. As you know, complications of diabetes are of a vascular origin. Everything to do with vision or other pathologies known as encephalopathy or simply brain suffering. And the outcomes are quite different. But the thing is that there is a chance, and some use this chance while others do not. According to the general statistics, it is known that those people who have learned to manage their diabetes live longer than some healthy people. And they live longer and better lives precisely due to the fact that they have a need in connection with diabetes and they realize it, managing their condition. It has to be sport, it has to be compensation, so much information to hold in your head. Just to simply have breakfast, lunch or dinner, you have to do some crazy calculations. It's not just counting your carbs, proteins and fats. You have to pay attention to what reaction you will have, depending on the time of day and whether you are feeling ill or not. Maybe you were stressed, or maybe you were excited, or maybe there is an adrenaline dump. What did you do yesterday? What effect may it have on today? These are the thoughts that are with you 24-7. This is exactly what we're showing people that despite all of this, we live a happy life. I can feel that I'm becoming a different person. I already lost some weight, tightened everything up, and my stamina increased. I began to do things that I never did during my 30-year experience with diabetes. It has become a lot easier than it was at the start of the project. I only have one wish for all of you to be true to yourself and to stay fearless, to set goals that are just out of reach and a bit further from your usual ideas. This is the Diet Challenge Project, to be continued.